Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. I'm very excited today to mention our special guest. But before I mention him, I just want to remind you to follow and subscribe to our um, podcast. We have great episodes in store for you and great episodes that we recorded. And we'd love for you to become a part of our podcast community. So don't forget to subscribe or follow our podcast. Today, we have a, an amazing guest, and his name is Coach Matt Williams, and he is the founder of Epiphany Professional Development, and today he wanted to come on the show and talk about how leaders could actually become better leaders, and he has a lot of knowledge in this area, and he's going to uh, talk about what he thinks uh, different ways to improve leadership in many different categories. And he's going to sh share some stuff that you probably didn't even know about or uh, knew existed. So put your ears on and listen, because he has a lot to share with you. Matt, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm very excited today for you to be a guest here. Tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Thanks, Stacey, and thanks, thanks for having me. Um, you alluded to the topic of leadership. And clearly, there hasn't been much written on the uh, the topic. So hopefully, we can we can unpack a little bit about that today. Um, my background uh, currently, I'm an executive coach. I work with senior leaders across a multitude of industries, predominantly in the areas of executive presence, communication, um, self regulation. Those those areas which span a lot of behavioral. Uh, implications. Prior to that, I spent the first 10 years of my career with Hewlett Packard in a variety of sales and leadership roles. And then I left HP to um, make a run at turning around a small distribution company. We were fortunately successful, uh, turned it around, sold off pieces of it, and created a medical technology company in uh, the Houston marketplace um that we were successful with for a period of about 10 years and it became attractive to another company and was subsequently acquired so i went back i did graduate work at uh, ut and uh, organizational development and executive coaching and launched my practice so uh, that's that's a little bit about me and the background what i what i hope to um scratch the surface on today is a little bit it's kind of a blend between um, what leadership is and how coaching plays a role in that. Um, I don't necessarily um, advocate or hope that leaders will become coaches as, as the path has taken me down as much as truly leveraging some of the skills and the applications of coaching to improve not only their careers, but the careers of those that they're responsible for. I love it. You know, I think it's so important. Um, you know, so many people have their own definition of leadership, but really the, a, le a leader really needs to exemplify themselves as a leader. You know, people look up to leaders. They're their mentors. The, these are the people that they follow, you know, by example. And, you know, it's important to be a good leader. And when you look at leadership, what is your definition of a good leader? Oh wow, man, that's a <laughs> that's, that's a huge ask. Um, but 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 a good leader is somebody with a vision and the ability to develop the followership to execute that vision. Um, so there's also a lot wrapped up in that, right? Um, and it's the developing the followership, how they communicate the vision, how they engage with others, and how they empower others to achieve that vision is what kind of separates them. Um, leaders at different levels, different um, uh, different levels of experience um, and competency. Now, do you see leaders today um, doing a good job as exemplifying themselves as leaders, or do you see mistakes being made that could probably improve our society as a whole for the leaders that we ha currently have surrounded us in our nation? Well, and, and so you finish surrounding us in our nation, right? There, there's there's a lot of different levels you could look at that um, from, right? Whether it be um, political or um, various segments of of our society, but within the context of the business corporate world, yeah, I I, I think for the most part, leaders go into leadership for the right reasons, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, not only do they feel that they have the capacity and the ability to um, lead others toward a vision, whether that's theirs or the adopted vision of the organization, but they do it for the for the right reasons. Unfortunately, what I see though is that with that, they place tremendous pressure on themselves to to have the answers to to um, be the 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 resource and the source of. Uh, of answers and direction and solutions uh, for their teams and their organizations. And while on one on the one hand, you, you might say, well, yeah, that's why they're in that leadership role. On the other hand, um, the, the, the challenge associated with that or the downside associated with that is the others on the teams don't get to develop as fully as they, they might have, um, um, given that those opportunities aren't there. And the leaders themselves face burnout um, all too often. I do a fair amount of work in healthcare and in in, um, in oil and gas. And there's not a leader you don't run into that's not simply exhausted because of the workload associated with that. And so I, I think there's opportunity there. Uh, I think the, um, the, the, the reasons that leaders have gone into it and the efforts that they put into it are all, for the most part, genuine, authentic, and and well aligned, um, but I, I I think there's opportunity there to enhance their leadership satisfaction, efficiency, as well as the development of the organization to operate at a higher level. In most instances, um, what are some of the ways that you feel that a leader can delegate, you know, certain responsibilities, or um, how a leader actually can avoid burnt out? Because it seems like. A lot, I see that with a lot of leaders in, in the corporate world and even in the business world, they try to take on all the roles, even when they don't have to, they just, they feel it that it is needed because they are the leader in, 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 in that corporate world or in that business world, you know, what are some healthy ways to avoid burnout? Um, well, you, you, you mentioned the word delegate. Uh, initially, and, and so first and foremost, they have to be willing to 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 delegate. Right? We're all familiar with the term; we all know what it is. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of leaders that struggle with with that because of this sense of uh, of responsibility, or nobody can do it as well as I can, or I have the expertise, or wh whatever the reason is. Right? There's risk associated with delegating. If I give it to somebody else and they screw it up, then that shines bad on me. Right? So there's a whole um, uh, uh, there's a there's a lot of things surrounding that, that that can challenge that and and it does come down to delegation in some regards it comes it, it's inclusive in that as executive presence as well as a self assuredness a, a, a confidence um, in, in leading others and showing up um, in that capacity um, but I th I think in, in my opinion anyway um, the the thing that's missing the most is the application of coaching skills. Um, most in your audience will be familiar with the term coaching. They may have been trained in what coaching as a manager looks like. Um, you know, we can we can list off the bullet points of empathy and listening and asking open-ended questions and blah, 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 right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's not the, the intellectual knowledge associated with it as much as it is the application of it because somebody who's truly applying those skills in a leadership role will naturally exhibit those other things we were talking about, the executive presence, the delegation skills, the, the willingness to take some risks, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what are some of the advice that you have for, for people who are having a little trouble, you know, letting go? Because that is a big issue. Most people that I speak to that have a very big a very hard time letting go of the business and giving responsibilities to others, you know, from, from your experience and doing so many um, different types of, you know, jobs in the industry, you know, um, what are some of the problems that you see many face and maybe some, some solutions that people could start to implement that might help them along the way? So um, as, you, as you framed it, letting go, I just did a, a blog article um, and epiphanyprofessional.com is, is the website 
for anybody that's interested, but it's a, it was an article on the illusion of control. Um, and that illusion is that we have control, right? So we, we grab things, we hold on tight, um, we insert ourselves, we want to control as much as we can around us. And, th and that is a, a, a human need to some extent, is to have control. The reality, though, is we have very little of it, and we have to learn to um, let go, as you said, and, and trust that those around us um, have the capacity and the ability to learn and to uh, deliver, right? Um, and so it requires that we take a, a bit of risk. As you and I were talking earlier, you mentioned that that you engage in meditation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate of mindfulness um, and the practice of meditation, right? Um, yes. Because it goes to the piece around self-regulation, lowering mm -hmm. the controls on the amygdala so you don't get hijacked, you don't get emotional, you don't, your anxiety plays a lesser role, right? And yes. so as you prepare with some of these other techniques, if you will, whether that's meditation, self-reflection, journaling, all of those things to better understand why you are unwilling to take a risk, where, where the fear is associated with that, the more likely you'll then be able to take small steps into that and extend the the latitude, the autonomy that you give to others, and and then it's then it becomes a bit uh, self fulfilling, right? Hopefully in a positive way. You give them some tasks, you delegate it effectively, you check in, they perform, you build trust in them, and it grows from there. Um, so it, it it it's it's a bit of a process. You ask what are some of the tools, and and those would be what I would suggest first and foremost is is a lot of self-reflection, maybe a, an assessment that allows somebody to isolate certain areas that they might build or grow in. Um, but then journaling around their thoughts throughout the day, their actions throughout the day, how their behaviors, um, what their behaviors were a result of, right? Um, again, I think you mentioned that that our, our thoughts impact our feelings and our feelings impact our behaviors. And it's all, you know, the knee bones connected to the thigh bones stuff, right? <laughs> Um, so understanding a bit more about you in the coaching circles, we call it self-awareness, right? Raising your level of awareness around why you act and think and, and um, behave in, in certain ways. And then if there's an area that you want to improve upon risk in this instance, where we want to uh, step back and give a bit more autonomy to others, then you'll have a better understanding of why you might not do that and how you can begin to overcome some of that. Um, and then at the end of the day, it's just, just do it, right? Just, the, the yeah. Nike, just, just do it. Um, and then that experiment will hopefully reinforce the behavior going forward. Now you mentioned you see burnout a lot. Is there other like specific um, issues that come across your company a lot when you when you coach do you see um, leaders you know or people in the HR or managers you know come to you with similar situations um, common problems in in the uh, corporate world uh, yeah uh, which is which is why we tend to center on the presence communication and self-regulation um, from from a leader, so, so there's two aspects to it, I guess. One one could be an organization that's struggling with a team, right? And we need to pull the team together. Mm -hmm. um, and that's more around communication, appreciating other styles, um, and, and, and getting to know one another, right? Building some degree of trust. Uh, the other is executive development, right? So they come in most... Um, so when you, when you start from the beginning, most people are promoted based upon their achievements in some technical capacity. And I use that as whether you're a, an intern or a salesperson or an engineer or whatever, right? You show certain competencies, leadership recognizes your potential and you're promoted. Well, you're promoted without the skill set that made you successful, right? Because you're going in to a new space. So- yes. 80, I think the number is 85% of new managers have had no training. So they're, they're they're trying to find their way through all of this. And some of it's intuitive and some of it's not. So there, there's the 
when we talk about executive coaching, there's that piece, which is uh, leadership development. And that can be anything from in the, the manager director space, skills development, delegation, time management, uh, conflict management, that kind of thing. And then when you get to the higher level, um, the more senior level of leadership, then it becomes more a bit more nuanced. It's about mm -hmm. relationships. It's about influence. It's about showing up um, with with that presence that builds confidence in others and that type of thing. I think it's very important to have coaching when, you, especially if you get into a new role and you're promoted, like you mentioned, you know, you're going into a, a new position with, you know, with your old skills, but this new position probably requires a lot new skills that you haven't, you know, tapped into yet. So, you know, having a, a, a vote, a coach seems very valuable. Well, well thank you. <laughs> you. don't fear the button on our website click, uh, click um, yeah you know when i was in my previous role running that past company i had the, the the good fortune of hiring a coach um in my last couple of years that that worked with me and um probably the the the, the biggest advantage was I mean most most of the people I work with, uh, most of the people that that you you interview and you work with, they're all very in, intelligent, capable, accomplished people, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're not working with dummies. Um, right. The, the reality is though, in that, that space, in in any level of leadership, uh, the the question becomes who are they going to turn to when they have some challenge, whether it's employee issue or navigating organizational change or team dynamics or whatever it is, right? Who are they gonna who are they gonna call? They might call HR and have that conversation with them. But if right. there's any sensitivity to how am I showing up, what's the interpretation going to be of how I handle this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's nobody in that organization that doesn't have an agenda. And I'm not saying that in a in a bad way, right? But people immediately say, what does this mean to me? Or this right. is what think you should do, right? Where, mm -hmm. where coaching plays an important role in that dynamic is our our only, and, and this is what's difficult to adopt in some regards from a manager as coach role, but our, our only agenda is what your agenda is, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm a right. sounding board, uh, I'm, I'm um, a devil's advocate, I'm uh, I'm a host of things, right? But I'm not going to convince you, try to convince you to go one way or the other. That's your choice. I'm here to help you figure out what the best way forward is and then commit to that. And right. it's really hard to do as a leader because you know of a specific outcome you want them to achieve. And it seems more expeditious to just say, Billy, do it this way, A, B, C, yeah. right? And sometimes that is the appropriate approach. But when there's an opportunity with a relatively high performing um, employee that has the, the capacity and the ability to navigate, to figure out a path forward and to commit to it. That's when you want to coach and give them that autonomy, show them that respect, build that competency in them, right? And, and help them grow and develop. But it's hard to back away from that. It's hard to, uh, to, to not come in as the answer man but there's just so much power in that um in that dynamic that plays out um if if you if you can't accomplish that i like that i think that's that's really important i, I think it's very important because you know what i like about coaches is that they make you dig down and, and figure out they don't tell you what to do you know because everybody's role is different everybody is at a different level of thinking their abilities are different it's really looking into yourself and being honest with yourself and, and, you know, figuring out, well, what do I want people to perceive me as? What do I want to be looked upon? What do I want to accomplish? You know, what are my goals? You know, you know, where do I want to be, you know, in the next five years, you know? So if you want to be even in a higher role or a higher position, then you have to get yourself to a certain status right now. So you start to really get noticed by the right people and you start to perceive yourself and build your character into that role. So you fit into the role that you 
you're looking to achieve in the future. So it really, it, it seems like you have to be very structural too. You have to really understand what's going on with you now. Where do you, you know, who, what are you lacking? And be honest with yourself. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And what do I really want to do with my life? Where do I want to be, you know? And then figure out a strategic plan on, you know, an attainable plan that's realistic on how to achieve that. And you could probably do that really well with a coach once you're able to get everything, you know, understood and you know, you know, your expectations and you know, your goals and what you want to do, you probably could work hand on hand with somebody like yourself to help them build themselves to that person or that character or the person that they want to, uh, they want to be recognized as. Well, certainly we believe, we believe that, right. Um, we've, we've seen evidence of that and there's, there's, Kind of two pieces we're talking about. One is the external coach that that helps a leader um, navigate and grow and you know hit and, hit certain milestones. And then there's the the manager or leader who uses coaching skills to help others achieve that. And and they're they're a bit different in that um, I don't I, I don't contend that coaching is the the answer to every managing management challenge because it's not right um if, if somebody doesn't want to be coached there's there's no coaching that's going to take place sometimes right. leadership and management is very directive but it's but it is the leader's responsibility to discern um you know when others can be coached and developed in that fashion and then adopt that skill set there was a study by hbr years ago around six different uh, leadership styles and the most of them that were familiar with pace setting style democratic style command and control etc one of the styles was coaching and um the the conclusion was one it was one of the most effective ways to um improve employee performance and achieve outcomes but two it was the least used because it was uncomfortable people while they knew about it, they were uncomfortable because it's it's not natural to not direct people's activity, right? We're 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 that's the way we were led, right? In right. school and everywhere else, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not a natural tendency to to not step in and give direction, but to facilitate somebody figuring that out. But yeah. it is through practice and application that you get better and better at that. And so when we when we talk about the progression of a leader through an organization as well, right? Um, leaders on the front line or early stage tend to believe if I get here early, I leave late, and I work harder than anybody else, leadership's going to notice me. Mm -hmm. They are, and they're going to notice that you don't have the competency or the 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 ability to manage your time well, right? right. So they're not looking at the same things, and so by the introduction of coaching behaviors into your arsenal, if you will, you mm -hmm. gain greater bandwidth because you're not playing whack-a-mole all the time and, and chasing rabbits everywhere, right? Right. Th those are my South Texas colloquialisms, right? Um, mm -hmm. you're, because they're taking, the, the, you know, the, they're keeping responsibility for what they have responsibility for. Yeah. Um, you have the time then to invest in more strategic endeavors which is really what they put you in that position for to begin with. Yes. Uh, good decisions and being more strategic, but you can't do that if you're fighting all the battles. And that's why I really encourage managers to, um, to begin to, it's not so much push back, but ask questions, right? Um, we have trained employees to come to us for the answers. Mm -hmm. and, and the first time you push back with, what do you think? What have you done? What could you do differently? Any of those related questions, right? They, they look at you funny like, well, that's why I came to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we want to break them out of that habit because they're completely capable for the most part or most of the time of, of defining the direction forward for themselves. It may not be how you did it, right? Right. But, but as long as they get to the outcome that the organization or anybody's looking for, who cares how they get there? Right, to learn exactly. along the way, we've got to give them the latitude and the autonomy to learn along the way. Very true, and so well said. I think you know everybody really deep down inside probably knows the answers to their questions. It's just they want to hear somebody else say it 
you know, and reinforce it. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's really trusting yourself and digging deep into yourself, I think, too. It is. And that's what people experience and, and, and get to build upon, right? is mm -hmm. is I, I figured out this is the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to commit to it. So I'm the one that's got to be accountable to it. And then I'm going to make mistakes along the way, uh, along the way. But look, I did it. I learned, you know, I did it. And they can build upon that going forward. Where, whereas if, you, if the leader comes in and says, no, don't do it that way, do it this way. You've taken right. the stick out of their hand and there, there there's no, you know, while there may be micro learning along the way, there's there's no sense of ownership uh, to that when it's assigned rather than when it's created by the individual. Right. Very true. Very true. Is there do you how do you feel about communication? Do you feel that communication skills have improved over the years or do you still think we have a lot to work on when it comes to communicating um, with leaders, with their employees or managers, with their employees? Or, you know, how do you, you know, from what you've seen, do you think now, because there's so many coaches out there, are people utilizing the way they should? Or is the communication between one another improven in organizations? Because it seems like a lot of companies and a lot of corporations are starting to recognize the importance of coaches and they're having coaches come in, even in the corporate corporate world to help coach their employees. Do you feel that there's an improvement in any way from what you've seen? Um, yeah, it would probably depend upon the organization and the industry and, and that type of thing. You know, communication okay. is one of those really difficult areas. Um, yeah. and, and actually, our, our when, when we do some quote-unquote leadership training, right, the communication piece is always the most popular. It's the one that always gets the attention. Um, one, because people like finding out about the psychology and, and the communication styles of others. But, yeah. but two, they just didn't recognize how, you know, you know if, if, if I'm built this way, then everybody's built this way, right? And that's yeah. simply, simply not the case. So right. yeah, there has been a lot of effort in and around that. Yeah, in certain industries and, um, segments it's improved um, and and with so many uh, mediums I, I, I guess um, complicating it I, I think we're probably holding our own yeah uh, right there's verbal communication there's written communication there's all kinds of the the social implications now um, there, there's just a lot of attempts at communication. I think societally too, we've become much more divided and communication mm. is much more about me telling you what you should think. Yeah. Um, as opposed to me just shutting up and listening, right? Which yes. mm -hmm. uh, I think people need to do more of. Yeah. Oh, I agree. A hundred percent. That definitely has been a uh, big issue in the last couple of years. You see a, a lot of that. It's caused a lot of friction and, uh, I think sometimes, like you said, the best way is to listen and shut up. We learn better when we listen and we shut up. And then we actually can understand the people who are speaking and actually, you know, be able to really, you know, I think the biggest thing is realizing that everybody reacts differently. Everybody thinks differently. We all come from different walks of life. And, you know, because A says it's this way does not mean that it's going to be that way for the other person. Yeah, very true. Um, one, one, one point that we kind of press in on in our training is, is in and around uh, this idea of jumping to conclusions, right? Um, again, most of the people we're working with are, are accomplished technical people. They've achieved their success because of their um, their, their, their intellect and their accomplishments. Um, and so when they're um, when they're engaged with someone and purportedly listening, right, it takes, pick a number, um, seconds, if that, for them to come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. What that person needs to do or what they need to say next or what they want to ask next or whatever. And as soon as that happens, right, so you think about it, it's, and, and it's happening to you right now, right? You're, you're listening, you're nodding, you're giving me the, 
the the verb the the visual feedback that you're listening but there's also stuff going in, on up here that says well i'm going to ask oh i'm going to go in that oh maybe i'll do this or maybe you're just bored out of your mind i don't know um, <laughs> but there's there's things going on and as soon as we reach a conclusion we've stopped listening because we're right. thinking about our own um agenda or direction at that point in time so right thing I really encourage people to to attempt for a period of time is when you get involved in a conversation is be mindful, be present, really listen, be curious, right? Um, yeah. Don't go to a conclusion, but but be curious and explore further with questions. It's really difficult to do because we got a lot of stuff going on, right? Yeah, oh, 100%. But it's that kind of practice that can help people shut up and listen and be more fully engaged and I, you know, I had a um, a conflict resolution person tell me one at one point that um, it when when people listen and understand fully really understand the other side of the argument, mm -hmm. that conflict gets resolved. But yeah. most of the time, people come to the table; they only know their position, right? Yes. Uh, and, and so there's just there's a huge benefit in all of that I won't belabor that further. <laughs> that's so true though. That's so true. You know, that's why I, I like sometimes, you know, being learn how to incorporate mindfulness and and learn how to clear your mind and learn how to really open yourself up to not just your own thoughts and your own opinions, but to let go of those opinions and to really clear your head and walk into an office or walk into a meeting with an open mind that anything is possible. And it's not just what you think, but to really listen to other people. And I think when you do that, that's when the light bulb goes off and you actually can learn a lot from people. If you really keep your ears open and you are open to what others say, and it's not all about you and your opinions, you could actually really grow as a person, as an individual, and really excel to a different level when you are mindful and open and to listen to what others have to say because sometimes you know you may not look at it from that perspective and you may, might go wow I didn't look at it like that that's actually a great idea and then you implement it into your own you know agenda of how you know or your project or whatever and and it, it works tremendously. It, it, you know, you get an A plus, you know, because you just <laughs> listened to somebody else and, you know, you said, wow, that's a great idea. And then you use that idea with your own stuff and, and it, it you know, it, it brings you to even a higher level sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard to, to, to learn when your lips are moving, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's by, by listening to others, but that also, um, Stacy requires a degree of humility. Mm -hmm. right? We we separate in 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 what I do. We separate regular humility from intellectual humility, because there yes. are some, some 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 people that are incredibly humble in nature, and yet intellectually they believe they're superior to everybody else. And so that ability to lean in, ask questions, be curious, they they really struggle with right. So it's both regular and uh, humility, so that you're not you know, drinking your own Kool-Aid, right? But also intellectual humility to recognize that there's a wealth of knowledge out there and you don't have it all. Right, exactly. And I think once you realize that and you really are able to become a little bit more humble, you know, and really understand that you don't know everything, you know, because the people who who usually think they know everything, they know all the answers are the ones that know the least, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there, there was a T-shirt I used to have um, of a guy on a bike starting to jump over a a, a canyon, right, a, a narrow canyon, and it said something to the effect of, "Confidence is that state of mind you have just before you fully realize the entire situation, or something like that." Right? So we're really <laughs> confident when, when we don't have all the data. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So true. Now, if, if we had to take ev everything that we talked about today and you really want to emphasize on some really important factors, what are some of the things that you really want to get across to people, you know, about, you know, all the things that we talked about? Because we hit a lot of different topics, 
but you know, you, and you gave such really great advice, but from those topics and, and from the things that we talked about, what are some things you really like the listeners to understand? Well, uh, first and foremost, if, if, which they are, if, if they've heard this, they're listening to your podcast, I'd, I'd encourage con that continued behavior. Um, I, I think your podcast and others like it are, are extraordinarily informative um, and, and offer a broad um, spectrum of, of knowledge and information. I think that's a, that's a critical step. You know, after that, from a leadership development standpoint one is don't feel like you have to have all the answers because nobody does mm -hmm. um have the confidence that you can learn through any situation because you can right um and shut up and listen um ask, ask questions um recognize that it doesn't make you look stupid it makes you look really smart when right. you're willing to respect and entrust that responsibility to others oh a hundred percent a hundred percent now, can you tell people about your services, um, what you have to offer? Well, sure. Uh, most of the practice, and it's it's a boutique practice, right, is centered on executive coaching. Um, so I interface with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, um, sometimes with teams, but predominantly with, with individuals one-on-one -on -one to achieve some set of goals, right? And, and we define those within the scope of an engagement. We define the goals. We go through assessments, we determine where their strengths and weaknesses are, what we want to leverage and build upon or what we want to mitigate um, in order for them to achieve the outcome that they've defined on the front end. So it's it's fairly regimented in, as far as process goes, um, yeah. but it's pretty fluid as far as the, the way we get there, right? So there's right. the one-on-one -on -one coaching. There um, is also leadership development stuff we'll go in and do myself and or some colleagues that I work with will go in and do uh, leadership development training, whether that's emotional intelligence, it may be manager's coach, it may be performance uh, management, um, foundations in management, which covers a whole host of things, et cetera. So it is, it is direct and or online training, and it is direct and or online coaching that we offer. And again, I'll, I'll mention our, our blog, um, there's a lot of information there around executive presence and around coaching for managers and self-regulation and all of the topics that we've touched on today. So I'd encourage people to go there. And again, don't don't fear the button. If you want to schedule a session and have a conversation, we call it a discovery call. And that's what it is. Um, you know, 50 percent when, when I engage with other senior leaders, uh, it, I'm I'm convinced that 50% of the success of the engagement is mm -hmm. the chemistry between the coach and the client, prospective client. Um, if it's not there, you won't have a successful engagement because you've got to be able to um, fully trust the relationship, right, in order right. to unpack the things that are keeping you from achieving whatever goal or next level it is you want to achieve. I like that. I like that a lot. I think it's it's very important for people to have those skills, especially in the executive world. Um, you know, the things that you teach, I think, can go a long way and people learn by example. So when they see people, you know, and they're able to get to that certain level, you know, they've learned from their prior experience. They've learned they they've gone, they, they've done coaching, they understand themselves. And therefore, they're they're able to use some of those coaching skills, too with their employees and those those could actually be very beneficial also it's it's a great tool to get the snowball running and and teaching your employees good different values and techniques and tools that will actually help them grow and in turn will probably help the company as well yeah absolutely it's kind of a natural progression right i'm thinking of of the um, you know the, the the golfer who gets a coach nine times out of ten it's not a wholesale change right to, yeah. to the way they swing the club or how they they uh, play the game, it's minor tweaks here and there, and that's kind of what executive coaching is: is it's taking um, the skill set, the competencies, the, the 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 all all of that, and shaping it in a fashion that achieves a, an outcome that the the person is after, and in turn, then they take that and they tend to apply it to other situations. Yeah. Exactly. Now, once again, can you tell everybody your website so they know where to go? Epiphany, E-P-I-P-H-A-N-Y, 
um, the aha moment, the epiphany, right? Epiphanyprofessional.com is the website. I love it. Now, before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to say or touch base with before we uh, end this podcast? No, I'm good. Um, I appreciate uh, your your listeners, and I appreciate you. It's uh, it's been a uh, a great conversation. I enjoyed the talk. Me too. Well, Matt, you've been wonderful today. You've given you shed some light on a lot of issues. Um, I know these are a lot of important issues that I think are are you know that people need to really understand, especially when you are up in the corporate world, the executive world, the HR world, the managerial world. You know, these are things that you really need to you know understand and you know and also be. You know, if you see yourself and you're not exactly where you want to be or something's just not right, don't be afraid to go and, and find a coach to help you, you know, along the way. Because, you know, in any, in any you know, as we know, in the corporate world and in, in the business world, it can be very rough. And you want, you know, there's a lot of stress and you need to know how to handle the stress and make yourself shine as well. And balancing those two could be very difficult. So having a coach like Matt doesn't hurt. So, you know, everybody, I'd make sure that you go to his website, Epiphany um, um, Professional Development. And, you know, I thank you so much for being on the show. You've been an amazing guest. You've given a lot of great pointers, tools, and strategies. And I appreciate you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time, Stacey. It's been a pleasure. Same here. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.